Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today and welcome to this new lecture. So today's lecture will be on the so-called irreversibility paradox and I've put in paradox in quotation marks because actually it is no longer a paradox. We have a pretty good understanding of what happens but it is something that puzzled scientists uh, for quite a while in the first half of the 20th century mainly and there is some interesting mathematics behind. So what is it about? The idea is that macroscopic systems are typically irreversible. So by a macroscopic system I mean pretty much any system we can see with our eyes and uh, which are at our scale. And you can think of any movie, if you play it backwards, you will immediately notice that the movie is playing backwards. And it's not just because it looks funny when people walk backwards. Actually, uh, people are able to walk backwards in a convincing way if they train enough. But it is that maybe in the movie, at some point, a person will uh, drop a glass and the glass will uh, break and shatter in many pieces and if you play the movie in reverse you will see many pieces on the ground that suddenly assemble and magically form a glass and this is just something we don't see at our, in our world at our scale. So we talk about increase of entropy which is the second law of thermodynamics or about the arrow of time. However, microscopic systems are in general reversible. And in classical physics, that is because Newton's law is invariant under time and momentum reversal. And we have also something in quantum mechanics called a CPT symmetry, and which holds in most cases. Maybe there are some very exotic high energy reactions where CPT symmetry may, might be violated, but it will not matter for us today. So let me explain what I mean by this uh, Newton's law being invariant under time and momentum reversal. So here's a simulation from my channel and it's a simulation of the so-called Bunimovich Stadium Billiard. So here I started with a bunch of particles that had slightly different positions and velocities and they move in straight lines and make elastic collisions with the boundary of this shape which is uh, called a stadium and which is made of so two circular arcs connected by two straight lines. And you see that pretty fast the particles really tend to distribute in a very uh, random way over this shape. And it was indeed proved by Leonid Bunimovich, who's a professor at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, that this billiard has very strong chaotic properties. But now what we are going to do is that we are going to stop the system right now and reverse all velocities. So meaning that every particle made a U-turn and I didn't cheat in this simulation. So I could have run it backwards, but instead I really turned every particle by 180 degrees and let the system evolve again. And what you see is that now indeed the particles reassemble in a very ordered way. And finally they return more or less to the starting position. So more or less because numerical round of errors can make a small difference. And also, why did the colors not match? Well, that is because the color actually changes a little bit after every collision, but when I ran the simulation backwards, I kept increasing the color. I didn't decrease the, the color as I would have when I would really have taken the time symmetric system. Now here's another simulation of my channel, a very old simulation, where I start with uh, 200 particles in a, a system which is made of two containers connected by a small uh, 
by a small channel here. And here you also see what you expect, uh, which is that even though all particles started in the left-hand channel, they, after a while, start spreading more or less uniformly over the two containers. So after a while, the number of particles in both uh, containers is approximately the same. And again, I could reverse the directions of all particles. And if numerical errors are not too large, all particles should return to uh, the left-hand initial container. And that would look very surprising to us. Now, here's yet another simulation where now the particles interact. So here the particles interact with the so-called Leonard Jones potential. And you see their color here depends on their kinetic energy. So the red particles are faster than the blue particles. And again, I started with an initial condition where all particles were in the left-hand vessel. And after a certain while, uh, we have more and more particles arriving on the right-hand side. So one thing you may notice is that it looks like at the beginning the particles arriving in the right-hand container are hotter, they are faster. And that is probably because faster particles uh, will find the channel uh, earlier in the simulation. And therefore, at the beginning, the particles will be a little bit faster. But after a while, uh, this will equilibrate. And the pressure you see on the top here, it, it is computed by taking the force that the boundary exerts on all particles. And uh, it is uh, slightly averaged over time because it would fluctuate a lot otherwise. So let's move a little bit in time. So here you see that the pressures have equalized pretty much and the number of particles also starts to be approximately the same. And again, if I were to revert, reverse all velocities, I would go back to the initial state. And uh, so that would be an evolution that is compatible with Newton's equations, but it would look very strange to us. Now, what are the uh, what is the explanation of this apparent paradox? So here I will explain uh, what happens in a simplified model where I will actually assume that the particles are distributed randomly over the two containers. And now there's a lot one could say about whether or why this is a good model. And uh, I will not say too much about it because uh, that would take quite some time, but you can show for certain systems, certain type of billiards, that indeed the billiards will mix initial states in such a way that it is a good description to use probability. So to say that after a while the probability of the particle being in one half or the other will be the same. Now this is very hard to prove. It has been proved for some systems, but not for all. So it's still kind of an, an open question. But observations uh, show that it is indeed a good model. Now, here uh, we have to note that there are two possible descriptions of the system. So there's a microscopic description in which I will say uh, for each particle, in which container it is. So here I assume that my particle, uh, my atoms are numbered from 1 to n and I am able to see the number of each atom. So for each of the n atom I say in which half of the system it is and uh, I give this information and that gives me 2 to the power n possible microstates because there are two possibilities for each atom. But there's also a macroscopic description. And in the macroscopic description, I give 
much less details. I just say how many atoms are in each container. And now I only have n plus one possible so-called macrostates because the number of atoms, let's say in the left-hand container, can be uh, zero, uh, one, two, up to n. So that is n plus one possibilities. Now in our probabilistic model, we are going to assume that all the two to the n microstates have the same probability and which will be one divided by two to the n. Now let's look at some examples. So here is a case where there are only two particles. So there are two to the two, that is four microstates, and two plus one, that is three macrostates. Now I've drawn here all four microstates. So here I have assumed that the particle can be distinguished. Uh, so one is blue, one is red, and I can put two both particles in the left container, one in each container, but there are two possibilities depending on which particle is in which container, or I can uh, put two, both particles in the right hand container. But from the macroscopic point of view, these two configurations here in the middle line are actually the same macrostate. So that's why I have three macrostates and if I call capital X, let's say the number of atoms in the right hand container, it will be zero in the first line, one in the second line, two in the third line. And if each microstate has a probability of one quarter, I see that my macrostates have probabilities of one quarter, two quarters, which is of course one half and one quarter. Now let's look at three particles three atoms. So now I have two to the three, which are eight microstates, and three plus one, that is four macrostates. So again, I've drawn all eight possible microstates with atoms colored in red, blue, and green, and I've ordered them by macrostates, and so there are these four macrostates where the number of atoms in the right hand container is zero, one, two, or three. And the probabilities are now 1 over 8, 3 over 8, 3 over 8, 1 over 8. And for 4 atoms, we have 2 to the 4, that is 16 microstates, and 4 plus 1, that is 5 macrostates. I've drawn them here, and the probabilities are now 1 over 16, 4 over 16, 6 over 16, 4 over 16, and 1 over 16. So one thing you notice here is that some macrostates are more likely than others, and the more likely macrostates are those where the number of atoms in each container is less different. So it could be equal, it could differ slightly, but the more the number of atoms in each container differs, the less likely this macrostate will be. Now, what is this probability distribution here? It's actually a well-known uh, distribution in probability. It's called the binomial distribution with parameters capital N and one half. And the formula is as follows. So the probability of my macrostate X being equal to K, where K is any integer between zero and capital N, it is one over two to the N that is the probability of each microstate times n choose k, which is the number of microstates corresponding to the macrostate k. So it's n choose k because I have to choose the k atoms that will be in the right hand container. And this n choose k uh, is given by n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. So the factorial being the product of all integers from one up to n. So these are the same coefficients uh, that appear, for instance, in Pascal's triangle. Now here's another example where these coefficients appear. That's called the Galton board. And here is a simulation for my channel 
which reproduces a golden board with Leonard Jones particles. And so what we have here is uh, particles that arrive randomly from the top. So their position is a little bit random and they hit these uh, circular obstacles. And it seems reasonable to assume that every time a particle hits an obstacle, its probability to go left or right is approximately one half. And therefore, so here I think there are 10 levels of 10 horizontal lines of uh, obstacles. And so each particle will in principle hit 10 different obstacles and each time it has a probability of one half to go left or right. And the final bin a particle arrives in, well, it will be given by, it will depend on the number of times it went to the right, for instance. And so because of this probability one half, it will be equal to uh, exactly this binomial formula. So here, uh, capital N is equal to 10. And you can in see, indeed see on this simulation that the bins in the center are more likely, because it's more likely that a particle does approximately the same number of left and right uh, turns then to go all every time to the left or every time to the right. And so if I move a bit forward in the simulation here, you see uh, that we get a certain distribution which agrees pretty well with a binomial distribution with parameters 10 and 1 half. So this is this binomial distribution. Now, we made this observation that the more particles uh, we have, the more this distribution seems to uh, be concentrated around the, the middle, around n over 2. So here uh, are plots of this binomial distributions for n equal to 10, 100, and 1000, and you see indeed uh, that this is true. And this is actually an expression of what we call the law of large numbers. And the law of large numbers says that for any strictly positive delta, which is some margin of error, the probability of x over capital N being in the interval 1 half minus delta 1 half plus delta goes to 1 as n goes to infinity. So as n increases, it's more and more likely to be in a small interval around one half. Now this statement here does not tell us how fast this convergence is depending on delta, but you can imagine that the smaller delta, the larger n has to be uh, for a, a given target probability. And it's actually possible to quantify this. Now, uh, for this binomial uh, distribution, we actually have also a more quantitative statement, which is called the central limit theorem, and it says the following thing. So, let me look at this random variable x, and let me subtract this n over half, which is in fact the expectation of x, and let me also divide this by square root n over 4, where n over 4 is the variance of the binomial distribution. And then the statement is that this uh, recentered and reduced random variable approaches a normal random variable as n goes to infinity, and uh, a normal, standard normal random variable has this density proportional to exponential minus x square over 2. So it's this Gauss uh, shape, this bell shape. So here uh, I've made a, a picture. So the curve here is given by this exponential minus x square over 2 over square root 2 pi. The total area under this curve is equal to 1. And the probability that this 
centered we scaled when the variable x hat is in some interval a b will be given by the area under the bell-shaped curve between a and b and a way of restating this is to say that x over n will be close will be well approximated for large n by one half plus one over square root for n times a standard normal random variable so one way of saying it is that the fluctuations around this mean value of one half have a size of order one over square root of n so the larger n the smaller the fluctuations will be now we have yet another description of these deviations which is a bit more uh, subtle in terms of mathematics but which is interesting and that is the link to entropy so what is entropy well there are different types of entropy but uh, let's look at boltzmann entropy that is defined as the logarithm of the number of microstates for a given macrostate so the entropy of this macrostate will be given by the log of this number actually it is this log multiplied by a constant which is Boltzmann's constant but I I didn't care about this constant here now why should I take the logarithm well Boltzmann's idea is the following if I take two systems each one having a certain number of microstates and I put them together actually probabilities of microstates in the compound system will be products of probabilities for each system so you multiply probabilities because of independence but for the entropy you would rather want it to be additive so you want the entropy of the compound system to be the sum of the entropies of each system and the logarithm has this property that the log of a product is the sum of the logs so that is why we have the logarithm here so let's compute the entropy in our case so I take the log of the probability of x equals k and that probability was given by this binomial formula 1 over 2 to the n and choose k and then using properties of the log I see that uh, well that is minus n log 2 plus a sum here of logs of some factorials that come from this n choose k now for n large we have Stirling's formula that tells us that the log of n factorial behaves like n times log n for n large actually we have more precise formulas so a more precise formula would be n log n minus n and we can be even more precise but here n log n will be sufficient for our purposes and now let me use this in uh, the formula up here so since k goes from 0 to n it is actually useful to put k equals n times x where x will now go from 0 to 1 in steps of 1 over n and the log so the probability up here is also the probability that x over n is equal to lowercase x and here I have replaced all factorials by this Stirling formula so now you might object that if k is very small or very close to n then either k factorial or n minus k factorial will not be very large and that is true but for our argument uh, this is actually not important because we will be interested in x which are strictly between 0 and 1 so the argument is still valid there so in this line here I have just replaced all uh, k's by nx and I have used this uh, Stirling formula and then I can expand the logs so for instance the log of nx is log n plus log x and so on and when I do that there are some simplifications all the terms in log n cancel each other and I get the following formula now observe that this is still proportional to capital N and therefore 
it looks like a good idea to define an entropy density, which will be this quantity divided by capital N. And so it will have the property that the probability that x over n is equal to lowercase x behaves like exponential capital N times this entropy density when n is large. And this entropy density it has the following expression here. Now this does not anymore depend on capital N. So this log 2 minus x log x minus 1 minus x log 1 minus x and here I have plotted this entropy. And so you see it's a function which is negative. It's maximal in x equals 1 half. There it has value 0 and its minimal value uh, in 0 and 1 is minus log 2. So this result here states that indeed the most probable outcome, the most probable value of uh, this x will be uh, 1 half and it tells me how the probability decays. And that is different from the central limit theorem that was focusing on fluctuations of order square root n here we are focusing on deviations of order n. So that is why this is also called the theory of large deviations in mathematics. Now, uh, you see, the idea is that if n is very large, then the law of large number tells me that it is very unlikely to see configurations where the number of atoms is uh, not approximately the same in, in both uh, containers. And the central limit theorem and this uh, result on entropy gives me a more detailed description on what is likely and what is unlikely. But now in practice, how large is this n? Well, in chemistry, we have this concept of a mole and by definition, uh, one mole of some stuff is a sample of the stuff containing the same number of atoms as 12 grams of carbon-12. And carbon has been chosen because it's easier to make experiments with carbon than some other elements. But it will also be, uh, so one mole of hydrogen-2, of diatomic hydrogen, will weigh approximately 2 gram and 1 mole of uranium-238 will weigh about 238 grams. And it's approximate because of uh, issues having to do with uh, binding energy. So when the uh, nucleons bind in, a, in an atom, there's some mass that uh, can be converted to energy. All right, but what is this number? Well, this number is, of course, Avogadro's number, and its value is approximately 6.022, 10 to the 23. And that is a very large number, but it's perhaps not so easy to get an idea of how large this number is when we use powers of 10. So we could say that it's almost a million, billion, billion atoms, but uh, what does it mean? Well. One way of trying to, to understand it is to say, let's assume that I have cubes of side length one centimeter, and I have Avogadro's number of them. And let me uh, put them in a large cube. Well, this large cube, if you do the computation, you'll find it has a side length of about 800 kilometers. So 800 kilometers, that is almost half <coughs> the radius of the moon. So it's a very large cube indeed. But I could also have the idea of putting all these cubes on the surface of the Earth. And if I do that, <coughs> I get uh, a layer which is 1,000 meters thick. And I could also put all these cubes uh, in a long chain, one after the other, then I get a chain whose length is 600 light years, which is about twice the circumference of our galaxy. So this gives you, I hope, a better idea of how huge actually this 
Avogadro number is. And in these results with the fluctuations, we've seen that the uh, average proportion of atoms in each container in our simple model is equal with high probability to one half plus minus fluctuations of order one over square root n. And here one over square root of Avogadro's number that is still almost 10 to the 12. So one over 10 to the 12, that is really very small fluctuations and that's why we don't really see them. All right, so, so far what we've seen is that if we accept this idea that in our system the number of atoms follows a binomial distribution, so each atom has a probability one half to be in each container, then it is indeed very likely to have approximately the same number of atoms in each container. But there's no dynamics in this picture. So let us introduce dynamics now. And this idea uh, was first used by Paul Ehrenfest and his wife Tatjana Afanasieva Ehrenfest, who did a lot of work on uh, statistical physics and uh, quantum physics and so on. And they proposed the model where they say, you can again describe it in a microscopic or in a macroscopic way. So in the microscopic description, you say that again, you take this container with uh, n atoms and at each time step, you take one atom or one particle uniformly at random and you move it from the container it is in to the other container. But you also have a macroscopic description and what you say there is that you just look at how many particles you have in each container and if this number is x with probability x over n you move a particle from right to left and with particle with probability 1 minus x of over n you move it from left to right and this is actually equivalent to the microscopic description so here is an example for three particles so we have our four macrostates and we have these transition probabilities and in general, uh, the probabilities look like this. So the transition probability from k to k plus 1 is given by 1 minus k over n. And from k plus 1 to k is given by k plus 1 over n. And in mathematics, we call such a system a Markov chain. So a Markov chain on a finite set is a random process. So it's a sequence of random variables where at each time step you use these transition probabilities to describe the state at the next step. So you move on a certain graph on a number of sides and you move with probabilities given by what is written here on these arrows. So let's look at a few simulations. Here's one simulation where I've taken six particles and 30 iterations. So I have time on the x-axis, the number of particles in the right-hand container on the y-axis, and you see it makes some kind of random walk. So this is for one realization of the randomness of the Markov chain. If I take another realization, I, take, I get another random path, and for yet another realization, I get yet another random path. Now, one thing you can observe is that, okay, here I didn't go back in 30 steps to the initial state, but in the other two cases, I actually returned to the state where all particles are in the left-hand container. So it is possible to have that. Now let us increase n. So here n is 100 and I'm showing 1000 iterations. So one realization is the following path. And another one is this path here. And for a thousand particles and 10,000 iterations, it's, it looks like this or like that. 
So one thing you can observe is that starting from all particles in one container, you go rather quickly to a situation where the number of particles is quite close to being equally distributed between the containers. And then you have fluctuations here. Now, how do probabilities evolve with time? So let me take here the example where n is equal to 4. So here are my transition probabilities. And let me assume that at time 0, I am in the state 0, meaning that all particles, all four, four particles are in the left container. So I indicate this on in red on this picture here. Now at time 1, of course, I have to be in state 1. So with probability 1, I am in state 1. But now what happens at time 2? Well, you see I have a probability of one quarter of going back to state 0 and three quarters of going to state 2. So at time 2, I have this probability distribution. And at time 3, it gets a little bit more complicated because if I am in state 2, I can get to state 3 or to state 1, while if I am in state 1, I have to go to state 2. Well, the probability of landing in state 3 will be 3 quarters times 2 quarters. And that's 6 over 16, which I can, of course, simplify as 3 over 8. But let me keep this over 16 here. And if you do the math for the other probability, you find 10 over 16. And if you go still one more step, here are the probabilities you find. So the question is, do these distributions converge to some limit? Here's still one more step. Well, actually, the answer is no. And that is because if I go back here, you see that I started here. I'm in an, an even state. Here I'm in an odd state. Here I'm in one of two even states, one of two odd states, one of two even states. So if I start from a state, from a particular state, I will always alternate between even and odd states. However, what you can see is that as time goes on, you will converge to a cycle of length 2, where you oscillate between these two distributions on even and odd states. And now if I take the average of these distributions, it is given here. And this we have seen before. It's a binomial distribution for uh, capital N equal 4. 1 over 16, 4 over 16, and so on. And furthermore, you can see that this probability is invariant. So if at some time I am in this probability distribution, I will still be in the same distribution at the next step. So for instance, what is the probability to be in state 1 at the next step? Well, it's 1, six, one over 16 times 1. That's 1 over 16 plus 6 over 16 times 2 over 4. And if I add these two things, I get indeed 4 over 16. And the same is true for all other states. Now, why is this invariant distribution the binomial distribution? Well, you can check it. Uh, on the formula I gave you before for the transition probabilities. But you can also understand it by looking at the microstates. So if I describe my system with all its microstates, for instance, for n equals 2 in this picture, I have these four microstates. And now the transition probabilities are always one half. So for instance, if I start with both particles in the left container. When I move a particle, I move either the blue or the red particle. If I move the red particle, I land in this configuration, this microstate. And if I move the blue particle, I land in this microstate. 
So all transition probabilities are now one half. And just by symmetry, it is quite obvious that the invariant probability distribution is uniform. So it's one quarter for each state. And it's easy to check that it is invariant. Now, what happens for three particles? Well, now the, the graph of my transitions is a bit more complicated because from each configuration, each, each microstate, I can move each of the three particles. So here I've showed in blue arrows what happens when I move the blue particle, in red arrows what happens with the red particle, and in green for the green particle. Now, what is this graph I obtain here? Well, if you have ever been to Brussels, or maybe you are from Brussels, you probably know what this is, right? It's the Atomium, which is a very nice monument that was constructed uh, for a universal exhibition in the last century. And it is meant to represent the structure of a, a crystal, or part of a crystal, made of atoms on a cubic lattice. And uh, it's really quite fun, so you can really go uh, from one sphere to the other, so there are elevators or stairs uh, to move there, and there are some exhibitions. So if you d uh, disregard the central sphere here, all these spheres are on a cube, and there are three different heights. So there's the, the sphere at the bottom. There are three spheres at a certain height, three more which are higher, and one which is the highest, which is exactly what we have on this picture here. So again, here I have eight microstates. The transition probabilities are all the same. It's one over three now. Therefore, the invariant microstate is uniform. Each state has a probability of one over eight. But if I collect these into microstates, I have one macrostate at the bottom, then I have three, three, and one, and I get this binomial distribution because I just do a sum over microstates, and the number of microstates is given by uh, n choose k coefficient. So we have understood why the binomial distribution is invariant in our system, but now let's look at what we call recurrence times. So the mean recurrence time at a certain state is by definition the average time between two consecutive visits at that state. So for instance here for n equals 100 I have taken uh, I guess it's 44. So state 44 is visited the first time at uh, time uh, something like 84 maybe and then again at time is 86 and 88 and 90 and then it isn't visited for some time it's visited again at time uh, 122 maybe and uh, once more a bit later and then not anymore during this simulation. Now the mean recurrence time at state 44 is the average of all these times between visits, which are 2, 2, 2, and then, uh, what is it, it's 32, and so on. But if I do uh, this in the limit of uh, infinitely long times. So here is another example with a thousand particles. And, okay, you see that these times at which I visit a certain state are pretty random, but I can try to define the expectation of the time intervals. And there is actually uh, an important theorem in the theory of Markov change, which says that if PK is the invariant probability of state number K, so given for us by this binomial distribution, 
then the mean recurrence time to that state is the inverse of pk. So let's look at an example. So for three particles, three atoms, the invariant distribution has probabilities 1 over 8, 3 over 8, 3 over 8, 1 over 8. So what this result says is that the mean recurrence time to state 0 is 8, as also is the case for state number 3. And for the two middle states, the mean recurrence time is actually 8 over 3. So remember, this is an average, so it doesn't have to be an integer. So having a fraction here is perfectly acceptable. Now let me just give you an idea instead of a whole proof of why this is true. So again, let me take n equals 3 and let me look at state 0. And let me call ni the average number of visits of state i between two visits of state 0 with the convention that n0 is equal to 1. And then what you do is that you check that the vector of these ni's, so n0, n1, n2, and 2 and 3 is invariant by the Markov chain. And the intuition for that is that when the chain uh, runs for a long time, it is in equilibrium, and so the number of visits uh, at each other state between two visits in a certain state has always had to have the same distribution. So it's a form of time invariance. And you can actually show that the binomial distribution is the only invariant distribution of the chain. So now here the ni is not a probability distribution. The sum of the ni is not 1, it's something larger than 1. But it's an invariant measure, and any invariant measure has to be a multiple of this invariant distribution of the pi. And therefore, since n0 is 1 and n is a multiple of this 1 over 8, etc., n has to be equal to 1, 3, 3, 1. So it means that on average between two visits of state 1, or of state 0, you will visit state 1 three times, state 2 three times, and state 3 once on average. The same works for any other choice of n and k. And in this case, it means that the mean recurrence time to state 0 is the sum of all these times, which is 8. And again, you can check by looking at more general cases that it will always be the inverse of the invariant probability. Now, what does this imply for our system of atoms? So again, let's take for the number of atoms the Avogadro number, which is about 6 times 10 to the 23. And let's assume that at time 0, all these molecules are in the left-hand container. Now we can ask the question, what is the mean recurrence time to that state? So how long do I have to wait until all molecules return to this configuration where they are all in the left-hand container. It is actually possible. However, the time it takes, well, on average it is 1 over p0, where p0 is this binomial uh, probability here, which is 1 over 2 to the n, and therefore the mean recurrence time is 2 to the power n. And that is a very large number. So, how large is 2 to the power Avogadro's number? So that's about 2 to the power 6 times 10 to the 23. Now, 2 to the, th two to the 10 is uh, approximately 10 to the 3. So let me write this as 2 to the 10 to the power 6 times 10 to the 22, which is about 10 to the 18 times 10 to the 22. So it is a, a number with over 10 to the 22, 10 to the 23 uh, digits. 
And this is just a ridiculously large number. So I've explained before that Avogadro's number is very large, but here we have 10 to the power of Avogadro's number. So for comparison, the length of a year is about three times 10 to the seven seconds. The estimated age of the universe, according to current cosmological models, is about 10 to the 10 years, give or take. Uh, a certain factor, maybe it's a bit older, but that's the order of magnitude. So that is about three times 10 to the 17 seconds. Now you see this order, this time here, is 10 to the 22 orders of magnitude, so powers of 10 larger than the age of the universe. And even if I say that, okay, my atoms, they don't take a second to move uh, from one container to the other, maybe they take a, a nanosecond or something, that won't change anything uh, at the fact that this number is so ridiculously large. So our understanding of this apparent irreversibility paradox is that actually these uh, strange irreversible behaviors where all particles return to one container, they are actually possible but they are so unlikely that to actually see them in practice, you will wait on average for, uh, or for time spans which are uh, incom incomparatively larger than the age of the universe. All right, so that was it for today's lecture on reversibility and irreversibility. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you next time. Take care. Bye.